So when we got back, <clears throat> we have some of these kids, so we thought we'd build our own timeline. We'd call them Joe. <clears throat> now, the reality is these timelines aren't accurate, so they're totally made up at the end of the day, but the, the story in here is true, and it's taken from all of the agencies. The timelines, uh, as I mentioned, are different. Obviously, the name isn't correct, and that's obviously for the point the purpose of uh, protecting the individual. So, this young Joe was born in 1986 in Prince Albert. He was immersed in alcohol domestic violence. Joe moved to foster care for a short period of time. His parents had been drinking domestic problems in different locations. Mom was hospitalized in a car accident. Alcohol uh, was involved. Obviously, kids moved in the ground. Parents went through alcohol treatment. Kids moved back with them. Brother being violent and suicidal at school, and then wham. Mom stabbed father to actual witnesses this. Kids moved into the ground, and mom's sentenced to eight years. Now, the interesting disturbing part, these are the teacher's notes. This kid was a happy kid when he was going to school. The next year when this happened, obviously he became quiet, and the year after that, he became very aggressive. The reality is the teachers didn't even know this happened, because we're going to talk about this. This information we all collectively got together isn't to say that either one of us are responsible. It's to show that we all have a weakness but to show that we have a weakness so we can collectively make ourselves stronger as we move forward. So let's go on with the timeline. Mom plays children at, mom goes to jail. Joe referred to constant mental health, never given follow-up by caregivers. Grandma canceled the appointment three times, but nobody thought to follow it up and maybe take the services to them. Kids moved back to grandma because of money conflict between family members. Now nobody wants to pay for the young fellow, and he's still obviously a young kid. Mom's out of jail at the YWC with kids. Uh, mom was drinking and breached parole, kids taking the ground. Joe's brother sexually assaulted his sister, all moved over to foster care. It's disturbing. Mom released on parole, completed alcohol treatment, kids moved back with her. Mom drinking and breached parole, kids placed in foster care. Trial for sexual assault, sister refuses to testify, charges state on brother. Unfortunately, a circumstance that happens too often. Mom released from jail, mom back to jail due to drinking, kids placed in grandma. Mom released in parole, married a murderer in prison, kids moved back to mom. Joe missed school, anger management problem, problems with the law, why I will Now the police are starting to get involved as he's getting old enough to be involved. Violence between mom and sister Joe, social services and police are involved. <clears throat> Mom's new husband released from jail, the halfway house, ongoing violence between them. No food at home on many occasions, kids not attending school on a regular basis, why I will involve. Joe was in jail, kids placed the family. Mom lost parental rights. This young fellow went to seven schools in nine years. Now that social services, health, education information, what if we add the police information? As our board uh, did some planning some time ago was to invest in our IT system so we could actually start looking at the behaviors and the trends. So let's look at what that shows us. 2000, he became on the police radar screen. Again, the timelines are, are not correct. It's they're just made up. Mother was involved with possession of stolen goods, and when mom was involved with that, Joe was the one that was due charge of multiple break and enters. So Joe was doing the break and enters to help mom. Charged with dangerous operation of motor vehicle. He was a suspect in the NBA and charged with another break and enter. He was charged with a dangerous operation of a motor vehicle. Then he was a victim of a robbery, obviously living the lifestyle. This stuff is happening within a couple of years. Charged with criminal justice act. Mother attempts suicide again, so it's spiraling out of control for this young fellow. And he was charged with robbery with firearms. And his family was evicted from housing due to gang and drug use. Charged shoplifting and bail violations. Charged willful damage. Charged escape custody. You know, when somebody would say, is the system working? Well, you can make the determinations. It's not meant to point at the system. It's just the circumstances. Charged YCGA times two. Charged with fail to appear. Charge escape custody times two assault PO obstruct public peace and then wham. Charge second degree murder protect <clears throat> another individual's life with an knife. That is it. So that's all good stuff. Tells us maybe that we can do some things different. Obviously, you can figure out that all agencies have parts of that information, nobody was sharing it, you're missing out on interventions that could have been done, and as a result, uh, the results are the results. But let's take it a little further. Let's see where this young guy grew up. Joe grew up in that greenhouse there. That's a two block radius within our city. Those red dots there, those are in his community. Those are people living in that community with multiple criminal code convictions. That's his peer group. 
you know, if we would have known this back then, we probably could have set a detachment up in relation to that area and solved a lot of issues. And that's what we do now in our intelligence led policing is try to obviously predict and intervene when we can in certain areas. So let's move on a little bit here and just talk about something else that's uh, real hot and Greg Kalinowski, the Sergeant of Police Service, is looking at this because really what we're talking about is problem solving. Let's change gears here just for a minute. Let's talk about missing persons. And this number here, 988, is the calls of missing persons that we received last year. 988 missing persons in one year. Now this is obviously disturbing because <clears throat> a large part of these 99, maybe 98% of them aren't missing persons at all. They're people, they're kids, generally they're chronic runaways, they're issues, social aspect issues, but 60% of these come out of our group homes. 182 of them came out of the one group home there, as you can see. Nine in one weekend, three kids. They ran, they ran Friday night, Saturday night and Sunday night. So nine times over the weekend and the response was call the police and the police will deal with that. Now the police obviously spend probably a minimum of a couple to four hours on every file looking for these people, but the reality is obviously they're not missing persons. They're kids that eventually come back. There's deeper issues that we're really not addressing. We just settle it by going back home and then moving on. Well, on the far end of this, you probably can't read it. There's a group there, a home that I'll have very few. I think it's 13 over a course of several years. They have an intake process, uh, they sign a contract, they're screened. The reality is these are all group homes within our city and there's several others. So if you look at it from a problem solving mechanism, then what if you took a best practice and made the best practice across the board? And what if you worked with the other agencies? Could you reduce this? Well, we predict that we probably will uh, reduce this by double digits easy uh, within the first few months just by putting a collaborative collective strategy together. But more importantly, getting the attention to the kids and where those people that are going missing and that need some help. So let's carry on. Here's another one you hear me speak about quite often. Anytime 32 to 42% of our arrests are from outside of our city. At this time that we did this one, 35, 65 was the split. Prince Albert, obviously people residing or using a home address in Prince Albert, 35% from out of town. If you look at this and put the crime severity index, take the most severe crimes and you put it on the scope there, you see Prince Albert above Regina, Saskatoon, and almost double moose jump. Now that's fine and that's what we're looking at this because we're an anomaly and we have to deal with it differently. But that feeder system is primarily, there are some exceptions in the across the province, is our feeder system from the north. So if we don't think we belong in northern Saskatchewan with some of the solutions, I would make the argument that we need to rethink that. Because obviously that comes our way anyway, and the reality is mixed with our issues and the social issues, we have to solve this collectively. Thus, that's why we took our RCMP partners and we went, because any strategy needs to be the anomaly of dealing with some of the social aspect or social issues from northern Saskatchewan. So, what do we do? Good question. Well, what we know is you can't keep up, you just can't keep throwing money at it. Obviously, we know that. That's uh, fairly elementary. Scotland said they needed to focus because they had exactly the same issues that were driving it and cost them exactly the same thing that we have. The only exception was that they were homogeneous, and the reality is they didn't have the influx that we have. A normal city might have 4 or 6% from some of the ones we checked of outside in relation to crime and criminal activity. Scotland said they need to focus. And they said more importantly, they need to have common goals. And when they have common goals from multiple agencies, that's when they actually start getting their solutions, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So this is a real interesting question. Who is responsible for community safety? Well, it's very interesting because if you look at the World Report on Violence and Health, it says the prevention of violence worldwide in health is the number one priority. But that's not the case when you look at the Saskatchewan Health. And that's probably not the case when you look at Canadian Health. But more importantly, that doesn't say health is responsible for community safety. What it is basically telling us that we're all responsible for community safety. Because unless we address it as a community issue, a community safety issue, policing is only a small part of that. Health is a small part of that. But collectively, we all own the issue because it hits us all, not only our bottom line and our frontline services, but more importantly, it's our people, it's our young people that we need to make sure that obviously have the opportunity to succeed. So, Scotland, they had a paradigm shift and what that paradigm shift looked like is a real thick document called the Concordia in Scotland. 
And it's a document that basically, in a, in a bit of a, a review, uh, overall snapshot of it was uh, drafted as a concordant document, went down to the local and regional le uh, level. <clears throat> the government, the federal government, put some seed money into it. And to get that seed money, they had to have the common priorities. So what they did is they formed a GCATS, Glasgow Community and Safety Services, which is basically what we were talking about mobilization. All people working under one roof, all the agencies under one roof with common goals and common priorities. They've been at this for five years in Scotland. They've reduced crime and enhanced community safety every year at five, some by double digits. Now, what they're just starting to see is they're starting to see a real cost saving. One particular area of domestic violence, they're estimated 10 million pound savings over the course of a couple of years. Because if you think about it, rather than respond five, six, seven times, they're responding once collectively. They're following up and they're trying to keep it out of the system versus just letting it spin in the system. So in Saskatchewan right now, I sit on an executive steering committee um, that basically, as I mentioned before, is called now called Saskatchewan's Police and Partners Strategy to Build Safer Communities and Reduce Violent Crime. This has been all signed off at the Deputy Minister level by the Deputy Minister of Corrections, Public Safety and Policing, Justice and Attorney General, Social Services, Health, Education, Municipal Foot Affairs, uh, First Nations and Native Relation, Advanced Education, Employment and Immigration, Tourism, Parks, Culture and Sport, and the Human Service Integration Forum, as well as all the police chiefs within the province. Now, our hope is that uh, the government will give this strong consideration and this could potentially become our concorda, that driving document, that overarching document that would lead to obviously a more effective uh, delivery of services from a collaborative uh, approach.